How's everyone feeling? Good? Yes! Woo. Give me a cheer if you're hungover. Woo. Give me a cheer if you're not hungover. See, they're, they're more sprightly, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's just after lunch and there's people milling around. I'd love some more people to come and sit for this debate because I think it's going to be a spicy one. Um, so how about when I say countdown, everyone does a big like clap and cheer like they're having the best time ever and we can get some more people sat down. Does that sound good? Yeah? All right, three, two, one. Woo! <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah, it's the second day, it's the afternoon. I wanted to get you all woken up, um, but I'm not up here to clown around. We are here to talk about democratizing research. So before we dig in, just to introduce myself, my name is Emma. I actually started my career in consumer insights, doing surveys, doing focus groups, and if you haven't guessed by the t-shirt, I'm now at Full Story working in digital experience intelligence. So. Democratizing research, collecting user research is something I'm really passionate about, and I can't wait to hear what the two sides are going to be today. Um, so democratizing research, it's, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Everyone's talking about how can we democratize our data, but it's nothing new. I'm sure everyone here has had issues trying to access user data, maybe even if you've got access, trying to understand it, how do we use it best to our advantage. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, so I don't know the answer. That's why I'm excited that you two <laughs> are going to help with that. Um, and we're all aiming to be more data driven, more data driven in our decisions. But does that mean giving everyone access to all user research data? Or should we have a more structured approach? what's going to be the best way. So the two, these two guys are going to be quite polar opposite. Quite, I've asked them to be quite extreme in the two views. Um, so it's going to be fun. OK, so the two experts we have on stage today, um, on my left here, um, is Mike Brown, who is head of design at read.co.uk, one of the UK's leading recruitment platforms. And you spend most of your time managing designers and researchers. You have a B2B and a B2C marketplace. So you're very busy doing that and finding the data to do that. Uh, Mike here works in London, lives in Glasgow, long commute, but is actually from Australia. Um, so don't mention the rugby. Yeah, keep, keep that on the lowdown. Um, and Mike, you said you, you are a cliche in that you love to barbecue whenever the sun is out. It's true. Which isn't very often in Glasgow, yeah. but he does his best. Um, I'm, I'm doing this like it's a dating show format. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Mike here will be arguing for democratizing user research. And then AJ is team against. <laughs> and AJ, <laughs> yeah. AJ is a senior UX designer at Ocado, focusing on robotic and automation hardware. Um, AJ, in his spare time, is an amateur actor and actually has a show of Spamalot happening next week um, and is missing final rehearsals to be here today with you all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and the last time that AJ was in Dublin, he broke a rib. So oh. any broken ribs this year? No. Not yet. Far less scathed this time around. <laughs> Dublin's been kinder the second time. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> okay, Emerson may break my rib later, but like you heard it here first if it happens. <laughs> right, so these are our two brave participants today. Let's get started with the debate. I know we've had a few of these formats so far, so if you haven't already, make sure you scan the QR code to join, and then you'll be able to vote. There'll be four questions. You two will have two minutes for each question, and after each question, you all get to vote with who convinced you the most. We'll then do closing arguments. We'll have the overall winner. Um, does that sound good? Mike's doing last-minute last, last minute prep there. Yeah. Mike's already in all the right. zone. I'm well, quite nervous. <laughs> Mike, you're actually going first. Mm -hmm. oh. The first question we're starting off with, are product teams more efficient with or without democratizing research? So it's vastly more efficient moving to a democratized research um, process. We did that at read.co.uk, and year on year, we increased the amount of research that we completed, the number of studies we completed, by 1,300%. That's it. No, no, I've got, I've, got, <laughs> I've got more. But that's, but that's really the headline, the headline stat. 
by doing it properly, and it's not sort of, I think when people hear democratize research, they just think of chaos where everyone in the business can kind of run around doing um, their own research without much quality or guardrails there. But the way we do it is that essentially the product teams own the whole process. So they don't just plan the research, they conduct it themselves with the support of dedicated researchers. So the researchers are there to help and support, but crucially, they're no longer bottlenecks. You don't have to wait for the availability of the researcher and hope that you have enough time. It means that the teams are in control of how they do the research and when they, when they do the research. But with the support of the researchers to maintain that quality. So what, what that means is that we do so much more than we did before. We, we went from a business that tested very occasionally and not very well to one that's now testing every single week. And that means that um, product teams can be vastly more efficient because all the decisions they're making are now based on insights and data. All right. Oh, time to spare. Thank you, Mike. Oh. AJ, do you want to have your two minutes starting now? Sure. Your teams would be more efficient if you don't do it. <laughs> That's about it. I want to I talk about something practical when we talk about this, because I love the idea, right? Product team, it, it's a good vision, right? They get involved, they own that process, but training them up to do that process well, that might be more of an issue. And then as people turn over, your process is only good as, as good as the people who are running it. So I want a quick show of hands of people in the room. Who in this room is someone that might end up doing research if it was democratized in your company? So like maybe team leads, like maybe product people. Yeah, smattering of hands, OK. Um, now, I'm not talking here about like designers, right? I had someone over in this corner yesterday amazingly said, like, I wouldn't trust a UX designer who doesn't do their own validation research, right? fundamentally agree with that. That's not what we're talking about here. But put your hands back up if you're those people. So those people in the crowd who might have to do this if we decided to do it, keep those hands nice and high. OK, so there's a smattering of you. Those of you out there, assuming you walk, work a 40-hour week, put your hand down, you people, with your hands up if you are consistently working less than your contracted hours a week. OK, a couple of hands down. Most hands still up, right? And so my point on this is it's a capacity piece, right? What we end up doing is we're putting someone else's job on someone who is already overworked, is already trying to do a whole bunch of stuff. And that means that they're going to be stressed or they're going to skimp on something else. So in the short term, you end up with like overworked, stressed people. Long term, maybe we risk burnout, higher turnover, knowledge loss from our organization. None of these things are efficient for your product team. So in the initial moment, maybe, it feels great because you're starting to get more data coming in. But I'd argue long term, all you're doing is stressing people out and pushing them past capacity by moving to a more generalized view of doing things. Well done. <laughs> 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 well, so now it's time for voting. So we know how you're going to vote. Um, so <laughs> who was more convinced? Are you more convinced to move towards democratized research or against? Let's see. You do a bit of a drum roll. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh. oh. oh it's that's to close. You, it's close. Oh. I don't know. All right, so I think, nice. Mike, you just pipped this one. Yes. Well done. Well, to make it fair, we're going to swap who goes first next time. So, AJ, I'm afraid you're up again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this time, rather than talking about efficiency, we are asking, are product teams more effective with or without democratizing research? Sure. So, Mike brilliantly made the point I was hoping he'd make in the last question, right? The, if you democratize, you end up with more data at a point of decision making. And so arguably, if that's true, yes, you end up being more effective, right? You end up going down fewer rabbit holes. My point about capacity is way off, right? Because you spend less time wasting on your product and more time working on the right sort of things. I think the trouble of that, though, is that research is a complicated discipline. So to do it right and to do it properly, you do need a level of expertise and a level of focus on that in the moment. So when you go and do your research, right, the data you get back is never really clear. Okay? You have to go and dive into it. You have to go and try and understand it more. And ha not having the time to deep dive into the clarity of what you're looking at means you're going to end up with, at best, shallow insights. At worst, you're going to end up drawing the wrong conclusions from the data you've got. And that's assuming that before all of that, you manage to phrase the questions you want to ask in the right way, which is harder than it sounds, and you actually collect the data you're looking to collect. 
I'd argue that probably you end up being less effective because you collect the wrong information, you don't analyze it to the depth you need to to get true insight about what's right for your product, and then we end up going down way more rabbit holes because we're focused in the wrong areas. Whereas if we just left it in a specialized field, then maybe we would have clearer insights of what to do. Yeah. Great. Mike, your rebuttal. OK. Well, I think it's interesting, because um, AJ was actually making one of my points for me, really, ah. which is um, <laughs> essentially I completely disagree with what he was saying. Because when you democratize research and you actually put research in the hands of the product team, give them the ownership of it, you do get a deeper level of understanding, because they're researching the products that they work in day to day. The best researchers in the world, when they work across a complex um, company like ours, which has multiple very different, very different products, the best researcher in the world can't be on top of every single detail in every single product. They're constantly having to context switch when they're moving from um, subject to subject, testing different things. They can't possibly have the level of detail and level of understanding that the product teams who work on this stuff day to day have. So when the product teams own the entire piece of research, they're going to have deep, they're going to be have a deeper understanding. The the results are going to be better, and that's. Like, I, this isn't theory for me. This has been borne out by the results that we see every, every week in, at read.co.uk. And the, the biggest thing, I think, the biggest thing when we're talking about making product teams more effective is democratizing research leads to more research. We've proven that. With more, with more insights, teams are going to be much more effective. They're going to be making all their decisions based on customer insights, not just sort of hunches. Or I've seen team, teams that don't actually research, don't do so much qualitative research, they tend to make most of their decisions based on um, data and analytics, which is better than no data at all. But it means that you're constantly just understanding what's happening. Um, you can see what's happening, and then you might have hypotheses about why this is happening, but without actually understanding why, you're constantly um, taking educated guesses. Doing more and more research makes you more effective, and democratized research is the way to do that. Brilliant. All right. Everyone ready for the next vote? All right. Thumbs ready. Let's see. Oh. OK, this one looks like it's going more in your oh. favor, Mike. I'm sorry, AJ. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> We have time. We have two more questions. All right, we're going to go for around a 70-30 split here. Thank you, nice. voters. <coughs> right, Mike, you're going to be up again now. So we've been talking about product teams being more efficient, being more effective, but now we want to look at the business as a whole. So does it make the business as a whole more effective? So it absolutely does. I mean, I think we can carry on the same point, but it's on a larger scale that I was saying about the product teams, because with more insights and data for the business to use, the business can make better decisions. But when you actually widen the scope, one of the, thing, one of the great outcomes for us when we democratize research is it obviously made, uh, it vastly increased the amount of product research that we did. But by actually um, taking day-to-day -day research activities from the, um, from the researchers, so they spend roughly about half their time facilitating and supporting all the product research, Research, that frees up 50% of their time, which we use for larger scale strategic research. That's been immensely valuable to our business because it means that we're now constantly gaining insights which um, are looking ahead, larger pieces which help power our strategy. It helps us um, be doing research on our, on our future, which makes our, um, our strategic decisions much more sound. Um, Another, another advantage for the business when you do democratize research, when you're increasing the number of people who are researching, increasing the number, it widens the number of stakeholders who are involved and understand the research. And that's really going to embed um, the importance and the understanding of research across the business. There'll be many more people who believe in it. There's much, much more chance of the um, insights actually being trusted and used as well. Because when, um, when everything is outsourced to one team or one, or one set of researchers, there's a chance that a lot of um, some of the product teams may not trust the insights, when they're actually doing it themselves, when they've been responsible for doing that, when they're involved at every step of the process, there's much more chance that they're going to, first of all, trust the insights and then also act on them as well. It's, um, it's very effective for a whole business to democratize research. All right. Very nice. AJ. That's great. I love, I love, we're just making the same points, but from the other side of it. I love that. Yeah, for sure. When you democratize research, right, you end up with the product team trusting what they've done more. They're going to action those insights more. So I think for this, it then harms the wider business, right? Let's play again the practical scenario out. As a researcher, the idea is that we drift off and we do 
higher level, more tactical, more strategic research. So we drift off on that amazing adventure that as researchers we bang on about forever that we want to go and do. We come up with a whole load of insights that are at a high level that will strategically improve our product maybe don't mean too much to the individual product teams on the ground, it takes a while to distill down to them. And then when we go and have that conversation with them, they've just spent the whole of the last however long doing their own research that they trust more because they did that and they didn't come with you on your journey. And you turn up with a whole load of stuff and they're like, backlog's full. Because the backlog's always full. But now it's not just full with stuff they think they should be doing because it seems like a good idea in a product meeting. They're now filled with stuff that their research says they should do. And when your higher level research is like, mm, but maybe we should change some of these things or this sort of stuff, you end up in essentially a situation where it's your research or my research. So by democratizing it, we almost end up with too much research in that capacity. And what does that do practically to the team and to the culture and the dynamics? Well, in one scenario, research wins. And you're left with a whole bunch of product team being like, well, why did we bother? Like, I worked over capacity to do my own research. And then you, it freed you up to come and tell me why I was wrong. So why did I bother? And then if we as research like don't win, if the product team win, then absolutely fine. But again, the whole benefit of democratizing research is to go and do that higher strategic stuff. So I think it can help. But I think at the practical team level, unless you embed how, you're going to feed those two feeds of uh, research in. And it becomes a bit of a nightmare for backlog management. Thank you. Just in time. All right. Voting time again. Who are you more convinced by? Business as a whole, should we democratize research? Oh. Make the business more effective. Oh, oh tell me the, the emotion that it might waste people's time worked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, AJ, so this one's gone very much in your favor. So I think mm -hmm. the feeling from the group here is it helps <clears throat> product teams be more effective, but the business as a whole, maybe it might not. Mm. Fantastic. OK, final question. So AJ, you're going to come up again. Yeah. Does democratizing research risk the impact of or value placed on user research? Unsurprisingly, I'm going to say yes. It does risk it, right? Um, and the reason it does, changing from the practical tact onto thinking about how we get people to do research right, it's a very different way of learning when it is your job and your craft and what you are doing day to day, right? Versus if it's something that's been thrust upon you, that's a side part of your job. So if you are in a product team, hopefully you go with the same attitude that a researcher whose full-time job it is to do research does at the end of a project. You look at it, you introspect, you work out what went well, what didn't go so well, and you build your craft by doing that. But in some of the teams I've worked with, and in some cases, like we're all busy. And so we democratize research just for the impact, which is to get data out the end. And so you end up with a whole bunch of people that, so your researchers aren't full-time trainers, that you've kind of sheep dipped through two, maybe three days of UX training, right? And then you send them out into the world to go and do everything. But they're busy, and so as soon as they get their data back, they don't stress about whether the job was done well. They just care about what the data says, whether it's good data or not. And they carry on in that way. And so it's. The effect of learning, I mean, it's Dunning-Kruger that basically says there's a point where when you start to learn something, you get super confident really quickly, even though you don't have too much knowledge. And then you become super not confident straight after that, and then you slowly like build. I think ultimately what we end up doing potentially is we can train people in a really exciting and engaging way, send them out with the best of intentions, right? We end up with a bunch of people who are like really, really confident but maybe not improving their skill in this area. And that leads us to an organization where we have shallow data that doesn't really tell us very much, that over the long time, we and then senior leadership look at it and go, ah, user research doesn't tell us very much beyond the obvious we could have guessed. Why are we bothering doing it at all? And then none of us end up doing research, because we can just best guess if we're only looking at I'm shallow research. <laughs> I said I'd be strict. <laughs> oh, like Mike. Look, I can understand AJ's concerns because the way he spoke about um, democratizing research there is, I think, uh, the fears that a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of teams, a lot of companies share. But that's only if you do it the wrong way. Because I, I can promise you from having implemented it properly with the proper processes that when you, when you actually democratize research properly, there is no risk at all. 
Because rather than, I think, like, if you use his example that um, we just come in, teams get a bit of training from a researcher and then never hear from them again, that could lead to decreases in quality, that could lead to decreases in engagement. But the right way to do it is to have researchers who are constantly involved, they're just not having to do it themselves. So in, at Reed, our example, the researchers are involved in every piece of research that we do. They help to support, they help to um, plan the research, they help to choose the right methodologies and they ensure the quality. And depending on the team, some, some teams might have more junior members, the researchers might be more hands-on. They might even run a few of the sessions themselves to make sure that um, the examples are being set, the qualities are high. Um, for more senior teams, with sort of senior designers who've been doing this for a long time, it's more consultancy. But the crucial thing is that quality is always there. And so if you, do, if you democratise research properly, what it actually does is it can actually increase the quality of your insights because you're doing so much more, there's so much more research in the business, so many more people in the business are being exposed to it, actually the value of it increases. Right. Last voting round on the individual questions. So who convinced you more this time on the impact, or the value placed on user insights overall? It's a landslide. Right. Yeah, so I did. Your guys are thinking more, more access equals more value place. Oh, but it's tilting a little bit. <laughs> All right, okay. Three for one, that's not too bad. I'm okay with that. Yeah? Yeah. yeah good. Well, <laughs> we now have time for closing arguments. So you both have two minutes to finish up. Who wants to go first for closing arguments? Oh, we didn't decide this, did we? I know, I just realized uh... that. Technical issue, guys. You won. You choose. So, well, you can go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a feeling you'd say that. Um, again, Mike is right. I think if you do this properly, then it works really well. In the few instances where I feel like I've fully managed to like democratize uh, product teams and work with them, it's been absolutely amazing. But I still end up, because they've seen the value of it, with me embedded in the teams that they uh, work with. So it has not in any way led to me having more time or time back. What it has done is put me embedded in a team where I feel research should be anyway. So it has a positive effect, but it has not had the effect that people want of democratizing research, which is to free your researchers up to go and do other things. So ultimately, I think if you do do it properly, like theoretically, it's an amazing idea. Practically, for the reasons I've stated, I just don't think it works very well. I think you end up with people who are overconfident, over capacity, stressed by doing something that is not what they were being paid to do beforehand. We end up with really shallow data, and we just make bad decisions as a result of it. But we're confident in those decisions, and there's lots of data coming in. So maybe perceptually, it all looks good, but I would argue under the hood, not a lot of good's going on. All right. So... I do feel bad that AJ's had sort of bad experiences with his sort of the, the early attempts to democratise research. It hasn't worked out for him and he hasn't had the results. But I can tell you from our experiences that we've had the opposite. So it's been a huge success. I mean, I want to finish, by, I want to finish how I started by really emphasising the fact that in the first year that we moved to democratise research, the amount of research, the amount of studies we completed went up by 1,300%. We went from a business that um, didn't, wasn't making many decisions, wasn't researching very much, didn't speak to customers very often, wasn't making decisions based on insights and data, to one that's now testing at least once every, at least once every week, powering, like the business is now powered by these insights. It means that we're making the right decisions, we understand our customers so much more. Um, the benefits have been huge, and they're, they're across the business as well. It hasn't just meant that it's vastly increased the amount of research that we're doing, but as I said before, the quality has increased as well. The, um, because the product teams own, the own, re own their research, it means that they're closer to it. They understand it more, they use it better, and they can get deeper insights because they understand the subject much more than someone who's just sort of coming, coming in and out. And the other big advantage for us as a business is it's freed up our researchers to take on these larger strategic pieces of research which they didn't have the capacity for before. So it's given other benefits to the business. It means that we're more, for more forward-looking. We still, uh, we're, we're basically delivering much more product research than we are doing before, all those insights that we needed, and these larger pieces as well. It's been a huge success for our, for our business, and I'd recommend every business to do it in the right way. So as I've emphasized, the, you can't, you can't do this without researchers. I think that the view that some people have of democratised research, where it's chaos, it doesn't have to be that way. If you, with, um, with proper planning, with proper guidelines, with proper um, processes, um, I believe every business could reap the, the benefits that we have. 
Hey, thank you both so much. Yeah. You kept it clean. Mm. Yeah. Nice. All right. I wish you could have seen the emojis there. People were very impressed by the results that you've had. Lots of the shocked faces yeah. were going up. Mm. Um, OK, so just to summarize, because I think that was a really interesting debate, we're going to do the final vote now to see who wins. So are you more convinced that when it comes to product teams, can it give them more time back? Do they have more data so that they can easily make better decisions when it comes to testing? Does it mean that they have a deeper understanding, so they're doing more research, they have a deeper understanding, and then they gain more insights? Or is it the other way around with products where the time it takes to train them means they have less time to do their job? Do they get it wrong because they're not as, they don't have as much expertise, so do they have to do more training, take more time again? And when it comes to the business, either side argued maybe researchers have more time back because product teams are empowered to do their own research. Whereas AJ was saying, well, not really, because you still have to be very involved in the process. Product, I, I, I love the, uh, it's the learning curve, isn't it? They might be overconfident and then realize they don't know as much because they can't get as deeper into it. So those were the two sides that were argued. We discussed how we do the winner. So we want you two facing forward so okay. you can't see the results. Okay. I'm going to face this way so I can see them. OK. I'm not right. hugely confident here. I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Right. Go. Oh, hold your hands. Okay. Okay. Right. We're going to see. It's all right, guys. It's still moving. Mike, I feel like if you don't oh. win, it's a sham of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is everyone finished their votes? It's still changing. Oh. That comment just lost you a few points, AJ. Nice. <laughs> All Sorry. right, and the winner is... Yeah. <laughs> Twisted your arm off <laughs> Mike. Oh, well done. You can turn around. It was 60-40, so... Right. I'll take 60 Fairly close. 40. Yeah. All right. Well, well done. Very good. And can we get a round of applause, please, for AJ and Mike? You. All right, so now you have the chance to ask questions. So if you have any questions for either of them, for both of them, please pop them in. Um, and then we have a couple of mics that we can go around with as well. Okay, uh, yeah, and feel free to vote for the questions that you're more interested in us answering. Okay, the first one, how to convince the CEO, oh, oh no, that's gone down, how to convince the CEO to bring first researcher to the company. So he gets the value, but I think still thinks it needs to be democratic. Maybe he doesn't think that you need to invest um, in that resource. So when would be a good time to do it with a business growth? And how do you convince the CEO? Who would like to go first? Any thoughts on that? Um. Well, it's, it sounds like a bit of a complex question because it sounds like they understand the value of research but not actually having a researcher. And I think it's a question you have to really emphasise, I think, the quality of the research that you want to do that, um, to show the value. I mean, I think I talked in my talk yesterday, I talked about how to show value of research. I think um, a really quick way to do that is to show how it de-risks the, um, the, the company, essentially, by if you show the... Of examples, if you show the negative um, outcomes from research, if you actually show the things that failed and then that the business chose not to do, you can then, if you quantify that, that can very easily show the value of every time, every time you research. And so I'd say that um, in that argument, you'd probably be saying, if we have a researcher coming in, the quality of our research, the quality of our insights will go up, we'll be able to do a lot more, and then that'll de-risk the company. And then the more you do, the more you can then show the value of the research. So. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, the point there, uh, your CEO has an interest in particular things, right? And talking to them on that level, so around value, around value add. Essentially, what they're basically saying right now is the insights that we gain that show that we're going in slightly the wrong direction from democratized research is like that is worth less than just paying an annual salary for someone. And I think if you put it in the context of those hard numbers, it's a slightly easier sell to be like, put a 12-month contract out, see who you get in, and then you can make a decision based on the return of that to go for it. I think there's an element, always speak the language of the, the people who are in that. And if the CEO is saying they see the value, but they're not quite there, then it's about pushing and being like, this is a number you can put on it. 
is it a number you're willing to take a chance on and go with that? Yeah. If anyone has any follow-up questions from any of these, do feel free to pop your hand up and we'll keep an eye out and go around with the mic. But no initial questions on that. So the next one, what criteria or attributes should we consider when selecting individuals conduct research aside from the researchers themselves? So kind of goes, fits with the earlier question as well. So how do you find the right people? It's a great question. I mean, in like our, I think our sort of long-term intention is that um, the teams are now, our teams are now conducting so much research that over time we'd expect that multiple members of the product team could be the ones running the research because they're all so well-versed, they attend so many sessions, they, they watch this. In practice, it's almost every single time it's the designers in the team that end up conducting the research, they're the closest to it. So I think they're the logical person to do that because they're, they're close to the design process. Um, any sort of modern designer who has sort of has been trained in UX is going to be empathetic and understand users and will, um, sh I think, should be able to adapt to the processes and understand how to do it. But I think that over time, like, if, when you're doing a huge amount of research, I think over time, um, really any member of the team who can kind of have that empathy and understanding of the process could, could step up to, to do, the, do the, um, the research. Yeah. Honestly, I think willingness, right? Like, it works really well. People, if they're enthused, if it's something that they're interested in giving a go to, at no matter what level they kind of sit at, then having that level of enthusiasm kind of downplays my point that they then won't learn and won't become competent in it, right? Like a base level of enthusiasm and then the support like you talked about, Mike, as you go through it, I think that will really raise up the right people. So I'd argue there's not really a right criteria more than, more than that. All right, thank you. Okay, how to deal with centralization of output so it's accessible by everyone in a company, less duplicated research, that's something that's common. Um, once having many teams doing their own research, any practical tips? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, we have, at the moment, we have a research library where everything, everything is published. Um, I guess the, uh, so, Essentially, that, that's sort of how we centralize it all. It's accessible to everyone. They can um, read every single report. We publish a report after every um, piece of research that we do. It's all accessible to the business. We want to move to a better system. We're looking at um, vendors uh, having a sort of proper research library where people will be able to search by insights, not just by studies. We're not there yet, but that's where we want to get to. So I think that'll make it really efficient for everyone in the business to, to quickly find what they're looking for. I think we don't really have a problem with duplicated research because um, as we said, even though the teams are all doing their separate research, there's still the oversight of the, the research team. So the researchers are involved um, in every piece of research, and they're really the, they, they can be that filter to, uh, to ensure that we, there is no duplication. If they see two teams um, are sort of looking for the same insights, then they'll, they'll make sure that we just do one, one study to get those insights. So we, we, we've never really had a problem with duplication. Are they the ones that check and write the reports before they go out to the rest of the company? So they don't, um, no, the, like, the, the product teams own that whole process. Uh, like we have, we have set templates, we've made it kind of as fast and as easy as possible. So we have um, templates for everything, for sort of moderation guides, research reports, all these kind of things. They're all templated so that um, people can just grab them and go really quickly. All right. yeah. Anything you want to add? I have nothing no. to add. <laughs> all right. Oh. This is one for you, Mike. That's a, that's a bit spicy. <laughs> yeah, if research Ooh. project went up by 1,300%, by how much did features, product delivery go down if your product teams were doing so much research? Well, the thing is, at, um, at the same time that we increased um, research by 1,300%, we also, we also drastically increased the speed at which we could do it. So we kind of sped up all of our processes. So. Um, I'd say we haven't really seen, um, it's not as though that capacity in the team was suddenly all being used for research because we do it quite quickly. We can, um, when we need to, we can deliver a piece of research, um, you know, plan, plan, conduct, um, analyze, and then get the results back all within an agile sprint if we need to. So we can move quite fast and I don't think it's, rather than I think taking time away from, um, from building features, I'd say it actually um, has probably just increase the quality of what we do. Because before we were doing all this research, the teams were spending a lot of time building things that didn't work because they, um, they didn't have the insights to make the right decisions. Now that we're doing more research, it means we're much more efficient because we're making the right decisions. All right. That was strong comeback to that question. Very strong comeback. <laughs> Love it. Um, 
Katerina asked, I liked how you were nodding when the opposing party was speaking, which suggests you might actually think the truth is in the middle. Um, being able to speak freely now, what would you consider? Yeah, this is a good point, Katerina, and why I mentioned at the beginning that we tried to force them to take very opposing views. I think I'd love to hear from both of you. So AJ first, how do, yeah. you, how do you really feel? Okay, I'm just scanning the crowd. Like I'm getting a bit of a nod from Rory that I'm allowed to speak freely and not just be, okay, a bit of a nod. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, for <laughs> sure, the truth is in the middle, right? Um, as I said, I've tried some of this stuff. Some of it has worked. Um, for me, I think my approach to this is, this comes out of having too few researchers to do research at the speed you need to make good product decisions, right? Um, and so the way I've sort of carved up all of the stakeholders I work with, so I have 28 stakeholders that I deal with across about 21 products. So that's quite a lot. If you like rattle it down, they get like a week and a half on average of my time a year if I was like equitable. Um, so the thing that I've done is go in, really understand the product and work out which ones have such I guess critical user journeys to go, you require a lot of my time. This is an important space for us to be doing research. And then the less, or like the middle ground, I've got sort of three tiers, like a middle ground where I do consultancy work for them essentially, like a lot of centralized teams might, where if they've got a thing, they'll come to us and otherwise they do a bit of research themselves. And then I try and democratize any of my products that sit in like the lower category on that side of things. I do a lot of both B2C and a lot of B2B. And some of that B2B is B2B internal to the company. And so as brutal as it is, we spend more time doing B2C research and fewer time with me embedded doing B2B internal research. Um, that's where the value for democratizing comes in for me on that side. So. It frees those teams up to do it. I'm a bit of a support to them, but there's an explicit understanding that I won't be with them for like the whole journey. So, yeah, the middle ground is probably right. You middle ground, Mike, or are you? I mean, to be honest, not really. I was <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think I had sort of like, uh, I think we've been really successful with it, but I can understand people's um, fears because I think if you, if people just want to say we're democratizing research, but you didn't have researchers, for instance, or um, you didn't have really clear processes and um, sort of guardrails to make sure the quality was high. I could see it being a bit of a disaster for some companies. I mean, um, so I, I think that when it, when, if it's done properly with, with the constant support of researchers, um, I think it's a really positive thing. And, and I can understand, I know that um, when you sort of talk about this or you've heard about this, some researchers are really um, afraid of this concept because it sounds like it'll put them out of, put them out of work. Whereas. I think the, the opposite is true. It actually just means that there's going to be more and more research being done, which means there's more need for researchers. It's a bit like the um, conversations that we're, we're constantly having about AI. Some people are worried that AI is going to take your job. Actually, it's just I believe it's just going to make everyone's job so much faster. It just means sure. it will be so much more effective and there'll be even more work that we can do. So I think it's kind of, it's kind of a similar thing. Brilliant. All it's right. To be utilized more than to replace, right? Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we've ran out of time to answer these final questions, but thank you so much, audience members. Give yourself a round of applause for um, asking great questions, being involved. Um, I've, I'm telling you now, AJ and Mike will hang around the front here, so I know there were some additional questions, so feel free to come and ask your questions. I promise they don't bite. <laughs> thank you, Emma. All right. Thank you.